So let me ask you, why do you do what you do? And what are you trying to achieve? Those questions and other trivialities on today's episode of The Buyer's Mind. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shaw. Well, welcome everyone once again to another episode of The Buyer is Mind. I am your host, Jeff Shore, and this is the podcast where we really want to know the way our customers think and how we can best help them. And today we have a special episode aimed at sales leaders. We're going to be talking about leadership intentionality. It's a conversation really aimed at sales managers, but still highly relevant to frontline salespeople as well especially if you know of the great Mark Sanborn. Paul Murphy, our show producer, we've had Mark on in the past. Always uh, a great conversation when Mark Sanborn comes around. Always a fascinating guy. Always brings uh, lots of great content. So that's why we're having him on again. There you go. Um, it, It was a great conversation. I sat down with Mark to talk about his new book, The Intention Imperative, really got me thinking here, and uh, I thought you would enjoy the conversation. Here it is, my conversation with Mark Sanborn. Well, thrilled to have back on The Buyer's Mind once again, the great Mark Sanborn. I've known Mark for many years through our affiliation at the National Speakers Association, where if the name Mark Sanborn is mentioned in a hall, several heads turn. I'd make an E.F. Hutton reference at this point, but uh, three quarters of my audience wouldn't know who the heck I was talking about. Uh, uh, but Mark is uh, truly, he's in the Speakers Hall of Fame. He, he has spoken all around the world uh, for organizations uh, far and wide. He's the author of more books than I could count, but uh, his the most uh, popular of those uh, over time, certainly the Fred Factor, uh, uh, the Potential Principle. You don't need a title to be a leader. And we're going to talk today about his newest book, The Intention Imperative, joining us from the great state of Colorado, Mark Sanborn. Mark, how are you doing, sir? Jeff, very, very well. Thank you for the kind introduction. It's uh, great to be back. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We've enjoyed having you in the past. And you know what you, you really at the just let's talk about the National Speakers Association, an organization you and I have been a part of for quite a while, you much longer than me. But it it really is you you certainly reached the point of elder statesman at a young age. I mean, do do you do, <laughs> do you feel that when you're at NSA? Well, maybe half of that's right. If I'm lucky enough to be an elder statesman, unfortunately, I don't think I'm considered such young age, although <laughs> age is relative. When my grandfather was 85, he came back, for, he, he drove up almost into his 90s and came back from a trip and said he'd seen some old guys talking. <laughs> and I thought, you can see old guys talking when you're 85. It's, yeah. it's all relative. That that is uh, that's definitely a, and my my father in law right he's eighty nine and we can't get him to stop cleaning out his own gutters so uh, and I, I I secretly applaud him I want to be there one day yeah uh, so do I. <laughs> I I would love to be healthy and into my nineties that'd be terrific yeah definitely definitely uh, it's, uh, you know you you have uh, you work in the leadership realm you're an economist by 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 uh, education in your early part of your career uh, but now mo- much more on the speaking and consulting side working with leaders uh, i'm just kind of curious before we'll talk about the intention imperative in a moment here but what sure. is the what is the most rewarding part of what it is that you do as you speak to leaders globally and very high ranking leaders i mean you're talking to you know the people who run multi-billion dollar uh, organizations what's the most rewarding part of of being mark sanborn well to me it's it's always the gratification that i help someone in my audience or through my books and what's great about working with leaders is is you you really have leverage when you help a leader become better regardless of how good he or she already is that creates a ripple effect uh depending on their what we used to call span of control on out mm-hmm. of favor term these days but depending on how many people are underneath them in the org chart they then have the opportunity to possibly impact those people. Uh, I do occasionally get an email or I'll meet someone and they'll say, you know, Mark, your book, your speech changed my life. And I'm always quick to say, no, uh, you changed your life. I can't uh, make my kids take out the garbage. So I didn't change your life. Uh, but, <laughs> but at the same time, I'm very gratified that the ideas that I shared in print or orally were helpful. 
Mm-hmm. You, you've got a uh, the new book, Intention Imperative. Uh, just, just before we get into the book, let's talk about the process of writing in the book. It starts with an idea. Uh, over time, it grows and grows. But it, it's an excruciating thing with a lot of steps and moving parts. And then at the end of the day, uh, I, I don't know how you feel, but I always look at it. And I, I'm in the I'm on a publisher's deadline right now, and and just coming up on that. And I'm in that. Oh, this is a. This is a steaming pile of, you know what, I mean, that's, we go through the self-doubt and everything else. By the time we're done, will anybody think that my baby is pretty, right? At, at the end of the day, do you go through that or is that just me? I, no, I, I have been through that many, many times. I think, and this will be a test, I think I'm through the sensitive years where a one-star review on Amazon ruined my day. Mm. Uh, that's just silly, although yep. uh, there are aren't any reviews for my book up yet, so I don't want to uh, jinx it. You know, <laughs> John John Maxwell, it, it, we, we did some business together years ago, and he's a great guy. And I said yeah. to John once when I was in my sensitive phase, I said, John, geez, you know, I got this scathing review on my book. And, you know, John's written 52 books, so he's mm-hmm. pretty prolific. And I said, what do you do when you get a a negative review from the critics. And he said, Oh, he said, Mark, I don't write for the critics. I write for the fans. Yeah. And I thought, boy, isn't that uh, a great, great perspective? perspective. You know, yeah. if there's something yeah. you can learn and there are sometimes things you can learn. I've learned some great stuff from, from, from some of my detractors, but yeah. more often than not, it's, it's criticism levied at the person, not at the product. And so you just can't take it personally, but it is hard work. I, I give you that. The only thing harder than writing a book is selling a book. <laughs> Most people don't understand that little trick either. They go, I want to write a book. Oh, great. I hope you don't think you have to sell it too, because uh, writing it is uh, not the most difficult part of it. And, and you, you know, you were th- just talking about John Maxwell. I was thinking about something I heard John Acuff once say, who is just a, a great writer in his own, but, but, but he was saying that when you over respond to your critics, especially online and review, and these people oftentimes are anonymous anyway, you don't even know who they are. But if you just thought about somebody driving past your house, rolling down their window and saying, hey, you're an idiot, you wouldn't stop and go, is he right? Am I an idiot? Boy, I mean, <laughs> you, know, you wouldn't do that. And yet we see it in print on the Internet and it must be true. And and then suddenly and we get overly sensitive to it. So, yeah. yeah. Well, my, my biggest pet peeve is people that review the book but didn't read it. I mean, I, yeah. my wife doesn't even agree with everything I say or write. So yeah. I don't yeah. have a problem with disagreement. It's I, I've seen reviews that were so untethered mm-hmm. uh, in reality that I just, it, it just made me nuts. Yeah, sure. I, I got a one star on Amazon for somebody who wrote in there. Uh, this book doesn't apply to me because I'm not in sales. And so I'm giving it a one star. And I'm and and other people got on and said, "Are you an idiot? What? That's the, anyway. Yeah, uh, what are you gonna do? Yeah, there what is some there do? is some positive self policing that's starting. By the way, my favorite yeah. review once I wrote a book called The Encore Effect, which is about yeah. how to give a remarkable performance in your work. Sure. Yeah, and my favorite review was a one star that said there are much better books on public speaking. Uh, yeah, actually, it wasn't a book on public speaking. So that's a pretty, I would agree with that statement wholeheartedly. It's so funny. People are funny. All right. So so tell us about how you got interested in this idea of intention, and especially as it relates to leaders. We have a lot of sales leaders who listen uh, to this program. And I think if you're in frontline sales, it's still benefit uh, to it. But your, your expertise is with leaders. So tell us about the the, the genesis of the book. I was doing some work with four of my, my best friends. We called ourselves, not surprisingly, the five friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did some um, summits and seminars and intensives with some really great entrepreneurs. And we were in Phoenix probably two or three years ago. And there was a diversity of people in the room from, you know, B to C, B to B, the, the world's uh, leading chimney sweep training business, um, a, a woman that had an innovative product being tested at Costco. And as we were going around the room and trying to, the five of us trying to, you know, do what we could to help these folks build their businesses, something became clear to me that I never thought about before. And it, it sounds so simple. It's going to seem anticlimactic, but nobody ever ended up on top of Mount Everest accidentally. Mm -hmm. Uh, everything that the people in the room were saying that challenged them as leaders came down to two things. The first, and it's important in this order is clarity. 
You know, these are people that have a lot of ideas. They chase a lot of shiny objects, go down a lot of rabbit trails. And of course you can always, you know, call that innovative. But once you have a business, you've got to pick a lane. doesn't mean the lane won't ever change, but clarity is being crystal clear on what it is you're trying to achieve. And that sounds simple, but I got to tell you, if you want to do a quick test, go to three of your salespeople and ask them what we're trying to achieve. And, and I mean, obviously the simple answer is we're trying to make the sale. Yeah, but why? See, the what we're trying to achieve is a what question, not a why question. Uh, you know, Simon Sinek said, start with why, uh, and that's fine. But <laughs> the best why won't help you if you don't know what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. I like to summarize it like this. Here's the question. If you were to do only one thing in your business to succeed, what would it be? In other words, that helps kind of narrow it down uh, to the things that you have to be most intentional about. The second point, uh, Jeff, is that you've got to take consistent action every day to achieve it. And I talk about in the book, the world that is not the world that was. One of the biggest uh, reasons people aren't changing is because they spent their lifetimes, whether they were in selling or sales management, learning what worked, and now it's not working as well. So they just keep doing more of what used to work. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the problem is we uh, can either change uh, before we have to, uh, when we have to or refuse to change. And refusing to change is gonna severely limit your performance. I, I, in the book, I wanted to write about, because I, I, I don't write for the cynic, but I anticipate objections. I, in selling, I think that's a good practice, too, and I think mm -hmm. it's true in writing. And so I thought, you know, I want to take the least sexy business I can think of, and I want to write about uh, an old school and a new school approach. So I picked parking decks. Mm -hmm. And the reason I picked parking decks, parking garages, if you will, is mm -hmm. because at one level, they're a concrete slab where you can leave your car. Right. But I've been in so many that were so nuanced in so many ways that I, I used what I call a synthesized story between uh, two operators. One was old school, whose dad said it was all about keeping costs down, minimizing overhead with employees, et cetera. And the other being a, a young woman who brought the best thinking on technology and personnel and culture to what would be considered by many a very dull and boring business. When you do that, you've got to, you're, you're trying to ask people to go to a, a level that oftentimes even their own organization doesn't want to go. You're talking to leaders right here and you're saying, hey, we got to get outside the mold. We got to be willing to embrace change. But oftentimes people find themselves at odds with their own organizations. And there's that fear of of making a mistake. You There's that, you know, I'm sure you remember back from your econ days, if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Ohio State University, I think I've got Correct. this. Correct. Uh, where when you initiated a change, what happens to performance? There's a dip before an improvement, right? There's that, that uh, you, you gotta, you're, you're going to have some trauma. And I think a lot of leaders look at it and go, well, uh, the dip it means lower numbers. I can't do that inside my own organization. So what do you do when you're when you feel like you're at odds? You know that there's an opportunity for change and you're worried about your own the, the reaction within your your own firm. Well, limited time, I would say risk is an inevitable cost. I point out in the book there's a difference between clarity and certainty. Mhm. Mm we you know, we rare, I just posted a a graphic from Kevin Kelly the technology writer who said we live in a world where the improbable is uh, increasingly becoming normal. You know, that mm -hmm. what we used to think was not just interesting or exciting or different, but actually improbable now, it, it doesn't surprise us anymore when it, when it happened. And I think what he's speaking to is, is that if you, uh, I, I mean, I'm not about, no, nobody on this podcast that wants to take a foolhardy risk, but to do right. nothing right. differently is the greatest risk of all. And I know that sounds so motivational cliche, but it's so true to do nothing you now are being uh, you're in the stream of business and it's going to take you where it will and probably onto the rocks rather than out to the ocean. Right. So I think that you, you, there is always going to be some risk. And by the way, you, you raised a point that I want to touch on. And that is, I realize first of all, just because you have the title of sales manager and this isn't to be mean, but doesn't make you a leader. Mm -hmm. It makes you a manager and it gives you a position. And the question of leadership and I've used this, this is in another book, is anyone or anything better because of you? Mm -hmm. 
leaders always create change and it's always positive change. You know, it's always improvement. And if you've got the same sales team producing the same amount as they were before you were sales manager, then you really are just the sales manager. You're managing mm -hmm. the, 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 the norm, a sales leader. And I know we get confused because we talk about sales leaders, the guy or gal that sells the most, but I, I think about sales leadership as I'm able to help Hey, let, let's just make the math easy. If you got 10 people selling for you, you know, whatever space, wholesale, re retail, B2C, if you got 10 people selling for you, if in the next year through your efforts, you can help them become 10% better, more productive, you've just added an entire salesperson to your team and your payroll hadn't changed. And, you know, to that idea of risk, one of the questions that I ask managers, and it's just, it hits them right between the eyes is, how do you want to be fired? Right. Do, do you want to be fired because you're just you're just going along with what everybody has already always done without any change and without any risk only to be fired because you're not getting the results? Or do you want to be fired because you actually stood up for what you believe was the right thing to do? And uh, which ultimately, I think, in our experience, Mark, you, you and I have seen that's usually not the, the what unless you're an idiot and you're <laughs> you make really bad decisions, but then you shouldn't be in leadership anyway. Uh, well, I want to say that anybody that fights the inevitable is a fool. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Let, let's talk about the three imperatives. You talk about three imperatives here um, th that go along with that sense of intention. The first one being from structure to culture. So, you know, these are we've talked a lot about about culture and about how cultures change over time. Uh, but you're looking at it and saying we have too much attention on structure that needs to instead be invested into developing culture. Is that the right way to put it? Yeah, you can think of structure as a skeleton, but it doesn't make an attractive man or woman unless you add all of the other soft components, tissue and mm -hmm. and uh, tendon and brain and heart and, and, and uh, organs. And I always say that culture is everything we think and believe that results in what we strive for and achieve. And you say, well, that's pretty comprehensive. Well, it really boils down to thoughts and beliefs that translate into aspirations and behaviors. And those are all very powerful things. Uh, you know, there's probably not a buzzword in business more talked about or least understood than culture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are a lot of familiar definitions. I think, you know, I just shared mine from the book, but I think culture is your, your organizational DNA. Mm -hmm. But the real point of culture isn't, do you have one or don't you? You have a culture either by design or by default. You've either got to, if you're lucky and you inherited a good culture, you got positive, engaged, motivated people, they cooperate, they collaborate and they win a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and they do it in a harmonious way. They don't, backstab each other and you know everybody gets along and they don't hate each other because mm -hmm. you can accomplish a lot but still have an unhealthy culture uh if your product is what you sell then your culture is how you sell it mm -hmm. and in the book i talk about five levers five very simple levers that you can use to design create or change or for that matter maintain culture and i'm just going to talk about one today Mm -hmm. In limited time, and that is don't just hire for function, hire for culture. You're, you're trying to hire another salesperson for your team. You've got three people with great track records. We all know that past performance is the best indication of future performance. So what do you do? You pick the one that's got the best track record. Only problem is they're a lone ranger. They weren't real warm and fuzzy. They admitted that they uh, like to be left alone to do their work and didn't like to be bothered by others. And so they're they're qualified. But if you've got a team oriented culture, you just made a bad hire. Mm -hmm. And too often we look only to the function, selling, accounting, uh, HR, and not to the question, will this person enhance the culture we either already have or that we're trying to create. And that's the thing about attitudes and beliefs and cooperation and a lot of soft skills. Topically here, you, you follow the NFL, Mark? I do. Not closely. I'm not a, 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 an aficionado, but I, right. I do pay attention. But Antonio Brown, a troublemaker <laughs> that he is at the time of this uh, recording here and currently unemployed, uh, gets signed by the New England Patriots. He lasts all of a week before they release him. But but uh, did that surprise you? Because the, you look at the Patriots and you go, this is a, a well-defined team culture. And then they bring somebody on who seems to defy everything to do with team culture. 
Well, if I could think like Bill Belichick, uh, I would uh, have uh, the world's best fantasy league football. You know, all I can assume, and I and I agree with you. I do believe that that uh, that, that Boston has a very defined culture. I'm guessing, pure speculation, that they they literally took a hail mary on his performance, mm-hmm. hoping, hoping, and this is by the way, this happens all the time. Hoping you can convert that person to your culture, and by the way, you maybe can, but it's going to talk. It's going to take you a lot of time and money and pain. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's why I ask, because I've seen this happen where there are people, you know, I've got clients and they've got a competitor out there with a salesperson who's just killing it. And they're like, we want that salesperson. And I, sometimes I have to step in and say, just so you know, when you take that salesperson and their results, you take everything that comes along with it. You're going to hire the baggage at the same time. Not always uh, the good move there, right? That's the issue. Oh, uh, so it's about- exactly, exactly what I'm saying. And it's one yeah. of those things. And, and trust me, we don't always think about it, at least not consciously. Yeah, well, that's right. because we often don't know what our culture is. And that, yeah, that's why that's, I, I address it in the book. Yeah, that's a really fair point. <clears throat> if I haven't defined my own culture, then I'm really not going to, I'm not, it's not going to be threatened so much because I don't even know what it is in the first place. That's a good point. Exactly. You talk about structure to culture. Then you talk about motivation to inspiration um, because there's this concept that, that people just don't want just motivation and and you talk specifically about young people why they do what they do is so powerful that they really want to be inspired i know these days you know millennials get a bad rap the whole living in the parents basement and everything but but your approach is quite different than that you're looking at it and saying no 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 they they want to be inspired are we giving them something to uh, aspire to yeah you know if you got a ferrari and it wants high octane gas uh why would you give it economy or mid-grade, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. It it seems to me that one of the challenges of leadership is to find out how people are designed and then to lead them in a way that's complementary and congruent with that design. And the the, the quote that really summarizes it in the book, secondary research that I ran across, but it's it's an interesting quote, 87% of millennials would rather do work that matters and has meaning than be recognized for it. Hmm. In other words, as much as, and, and by the way, every generation thinks the next generation are going to be knuckleheads. I mean, right. you know, <laughs> the boomers thought the Xers, the Xers thought right. the millennials. Now the yeah. millennials are just waiting for another generation they can sure. slam, right? Yeah. But yeah. I do think that that what that speaks to isn't that motivation isn't important. It's just not enough. Mm-hmm. That's why in the book I define inspiration as motivation to the power of purpose. Uh, it, it's about reward and recognition and reinforcement. It's about carrot and stick. But instead of just basically transactional, it becomes transformational when you can say, wow, what we're doing here really matters. Now, this is low hanging fruit, but I just spoke for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and I had a oh, chance wow. Wow. to tour them before I spoke. Mm-hmm. And if you if you ever want to see what a culture that has been built for years and that is absolutely uh dry, you know it's the gas in the engine that drives what they do there uh go go see saint jude because mm-hmm. they provide free medical care and do research for for kids that have pediatric cancer and mm-hmm. the numbers of families they have affected children they've saved or improved their their lives while they lived is astounding and whether right. somebody's working in the cafeteria or mopping the floor in the bathroom or doing research in a lab you all they all give off that sense of being very clear in what they're doing doing it and and doing it in a way that Danny Thomas was uh, so uh, so wise to create when he started the organization so powerful uh finally you're talking about experience to emotion you and I have a uh, a mutual respect and admiration for uh, Pine and Gilmore. I, when I first read The Experience Economy, when it, f- it first came out, I think it was 99 or something, and it w- we were still in the infancy of the widespread use of uh, the World Wide Web, uh, and, and yet the book was prescient to, to see what experience would look like. Now you're looking at it and saying, yeah, but now maybe we're moving even farther beyond just the experience economy and into the emotion economy. Talk about that, if you would, please. 
Well, certainly it's my perspective. And like you, I just, I was enamored with the experience economy and, and, and know Joe and Jim and passing and they're great guys. So this wasn't a, I want to take them on. That's not my goal. But I started to think about this question. And that is, is it possible to have a great experience and still be unhappy? <clears throat> because what the emotion economy says is that it isn't just the experience that people have, but how they feel about it. And what I'm saying in the book is if you want to elevate the experience, design and deliver for emotion not just experience. Experience is what happens to people before, during, and after they do business with you. But emotion is how they feel. Uh, do, you know, how, how many times have you and I had to grit our teeth and said, you know, I hate doing business with these people, but they still have either the best price or the best product and, and, you, and you go in and you buy it, but you still don't like them. Right. Um, you know, that's because this particular organization didn't design for, and in the book I talk about, 16 emotions. By the way, it's interesting, Jeff, uh, when I started studying emotions, the actual number of primary emotions some people think is as low as six or seven. Others say in the 20s and a few others can parse it out to like 120. Mm -hmm. The point is, is in business, there are some very practical emotions we want to design for and selling exactly the same. One being security. Do people feel secure doing business with you? We're trying to, to get our, our driveway fixed. And we've got a concrete guy who talks a great talk and does uh, says they do great work and has great pictures, but he's totally missing from the Internet. Uh, there's no uh, mention of his supposedly old family owned business. And the, the references he's provided, you know, have answering machines. and One had his fax on and he warned me his fax might be on. So that takes away from any sense of security. The guy's the best price, by the way. But. Mm -hmm any sense of security I have about the job being done quickly and being done well. Mm -hmm. So you look at all of the things that you do and you say, how can we make our customers happy, more secure, pleasantly surprised? And that's what I talk about. Elevate the experience by designing and delivering for emotions, or here's the goal for your listeners. They should say, is my customer happier they buy from me than somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's your goal. Because if they can become happier and that, that includes a lot of things in the value proposition, but it ultimately comes down to emotion. We mm -hmm. all have clients that we know do business with us because they like us. And we mm -hmm. all regrettably have probably had a client or two that we had the best product, but they didn't do business with us because they didn't like us. So right. it's about designing for positive emotion. Mm -hmm. You know, we had uh, Dr. John Medina uh, on the show not that long ago. We've had him on a couple of times, but the author of the book, Brain Rules. And one of the things that he said that has just stuck with me so much about emotion is that emotion acts as a post-it note on top of an experience that turns it into a memory. So, you know, we, we when we think about experiences and we ask, what do we remember from the experiences, what we're going to remember are those moments where the emotion uh, put a post-it note on it and said, remember this because of the emotion. So we don't just relive something, we refeel something. And in the sales process, that, to me, that was so profound because now as I'm making a purchase decision, I'm comparing what I've seen online and talking to people in person, whatever it is, I'm going to go back and I'm going to sort through all of those memories. What am I going to remember? What's going to stick out? And as it turns out, that which is tied to emotion is going to stick out the most. And by the way, that can go good or bad. But that's what it sounds like what you're talking about. Yeah, you could design a great experience. But they don't necessarily have to be happy about it when they are. That's the game changer. Now, and, and by the way, uh, somebody would argue and say, but a great but but isn't that how you define a great experience? Is that they're happier? No, it, it, it might be how we do in retrospect, because now I've planted the idea. The point is, is designing the experience versus specifically designing for emotion is nuanced. It doesn't mean there's not overlap, but they're not the same thing. No, you know what? I had a custom made shirt done not that long ago by a company, a national brand. And uh, the process of getting it done right to the point of when it, as soon as it was ordered, I started getting text messages. Thank you for your order. You can track the progress here. When it was done, they said it's on the way. Now here's a different URL so you can track where it's shipping. And then the day after I received it, it said, here's a URL. If you're not happy for any reason, this is where you would go. The experience was great. The guy that I talked to initially, completely forgettable. There's nothing emotional about it. So you, I, I agree. I think you can build a great experience, 
but I'm not out there ranting and raving about this organization because there's no post-it note. There's there's no emotion tied to it for me. So even though it was a a, a, a well thought out experience, it it lacked the emotion, and I think that's where we're falling short. Yeah, I think of emotion as the anchor for memory and, yeah. uh, and the the byproduct of experience, but the anchor for memory. I would say yeah. the only you know the only thing worse than being weird is being uh, forgettable, um, <laughs> and and that is you know a lot of salespeople. You know, it's funny. They may not sell a lot, but even the weirdest, wackiest salespeople are the people we still remember and talk about, right? We don't mm-hmm. remember the normal salesperson that was like the one on the cubicle on the other side, but the guy that, you know, rocked the bad plaid suit, you know, the, or the, you know, the person that had a, a habit of, you know, every time they made a call, you know, doing something bizarre, we remember. And I always say sameness sucks. And I think mm-hmm. it's important in, in the, the, in, you know, and I talk about these three imperatives, by the way, I say it, you, you're clear on what you're trying to achieve. And I help in the book work through what that is, what is action that is consistent and correct. And then I say, and when you're taking those actions, you need to focus on and include these three things, culture, inspiration, and emotion. Mm-hmm. Uh, culture is the engine. Inspiration is the fuel. Emotion is the result. I love it. I love it. And just uh, the book I'm writing right now on sales follow up and uh, permission, Mark, to put that the only thing worse than being weird is being forgettable. Uh, permission to insert that quote in the books. So my friend. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. I love it. I love I'll take, it. I'll take responsibility for that. Okay, fair enough. Uh, his name is Mark Sanborn. You can learn all about Mark, including if you've got an upcoming event, uh, just an incredible speaker. He understands the sales language extremely well. You can go to MarkSanborn.com uh, there. Uh, but to look at the book, and that's going to include some bonus resources exclusive to the site, go to IntentionImperative.com. IntentionImperative.com. We'll put that in the show notes. And sales managers, if you want to buy this in bulk for your team there's also information there on how to get that in a bulk order uh, be a great uh, a reading assignment the opportunity to go through this together uh, for your team to look at it as the leaders that they are to their customers mark sanborn uh, thank you for writing the book thank you for being on the buyer's mind always good to have you on the show my pleasure jeff thank you so there you go murph always good having mark sanborn on the show he's just such a He's a brilliant guy, but a common sense guy, right? He sees things that can be complex, but he makes them easy to understand. I dig that about that guy. Well, and he brings things down to earth. Let's face it. uh, I tend to be weird. Uh, Hopefully I'm not forgettable. (laughs) <laughs> Fair enough. There you go. Yeah, that is my new favorite quote, and that will go in the book. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, but I just love the idea that, uh, you know, when we're thinking about um, that clarity of intention and what it is that we're trying to do, and and I just want to speak here to the sales leaders as we wrap up this episode of The Buyer's Mind, as we're thinking about sales leaders, uh, you know, boy, do your people understand what the intention of the organization is. What are you trying to accomplish? And if you ask your salespeople, what are they trying to achieve? Could they come up with that answer? And I would just challenge you to to read the book just so you can get that sense. How much clarity do I bring? And then as you do that, you can look at exactly what Mark was talking about, the idea of going from structure to culture, that the product is what you sell, but culture is how you sell it, about going from motivation to inspiration, which is what everybody wants. We, as human beings, we desire to be inspired. It's just so critical. And then finally, from experience to emotion, which we talk about so much here in the buyer's mind, uh, if we deliver for emotion and not just experience, That's when we really make inroads with our customers. Such a fantastic conversation with Mark Sanborn. That wraps up another episode of The Buyer's Mind. So glad to have you with us. If you're liking the show, make sure that you are on iTunes and rating the show. We would really, really appreciate that. Leave a review on iTunes. And if you're looking for a keynote speaker for your next sales event, make sure you reach out to us. You can go to jeffshore.com and click on our keynotes page, or you can reach out to Bevan at jeffshore.com if you're looking for a speaker who really, really understands the customer's mind, but also how your sales people think that wraps up another edition of the buyer's mind until next time go out there and change someone's world 